Hey guys, how's it going? <clears throat> we are picking up where we left off from Hatchet. Um, so we left off with um, the pilot was having a heart attack, and even as the knowledge came to Brian, he saw the pilot slam into the seat one more time. One more awful time, he slammed back into the seat, and his right leg jerked, pulling the plane to the side in a sudden twist, and his head fell forward and spit came. Spit came from the corners of his mouth, and his legs contracted up, up into the seat, and his eyes rolled back into his head until there was only white. Only white for his eyes, and the smell became worse, filled the cockpit, and all of it was so fast, so incredibly fast, that Brian's mind could not take it in at first, could only see it in stages. The pilot had been talking just a moment ago, complaining of pain. He had been talking, then the jolts had come. <clears throat> The jolts that took the pilot back had come, and now Brian sat there with and now Brian sat, and there was a strange feeling of silence and the th rumming roar of the engine. A strange feeling of silence and being alone. Brian was stopped. He was stopped. Inside he was stopped. He could not think past what he had saw, what he had felt. All was stopped. The very core of him, the very center of Brian Robinson, had stopped and stricken with a white flash of horror, a terror so intense that his breathing, his thinking, and nearly his heart had stopped. Seconds passed. Seconds that became all of his life, and he began to know what he was seeing. He began to understand what he saw, and that was worse. So much worse that he wanted to make his mind freeze again. He was sitting in a bush plane roaring 7,000 feet above the northern wilderness with the pilot who had suffered a ma massive heart attack and who was either dead or in something close to a coma. He was alone in the roaring plane with no pilot. He was alone. Alone. Sorry, I'm going to try to make this a little bit brighter. There we go. All right. Chapter two. For a time that... For a time that he could not understand, Brian could do nothing. Even after his mind began working and he could see what had happened, he could do nothing. It was as if his hands and arms were led. Then he looked for ways for it not to have happened. Be asleep. His mind screamed at the pilot. Just be asleep and your eyes will not open now and your hands will take the controls and your feet will move the, to the pedals. But it did not happen. The pilot did not move except that his head rolled on a neck impossibly loose as the plane hit a small bit of turbulence. The plane. Somehow the plane was still flying. Seconds had passed, nearly a minute, and the plane flew on as if nothing had happened and he had to do something. Had to do something but did not know what. Help. He needed help. He stretched one hand towards the pilot, saw that his fingers were trembling and touched the pilot on the chest. He did not know what to do. He knew that there were procedures that you could do mouth to mouth on victims of heart attacks and push their chest, CPR. But he did not know how to do it and in any case there in in any case could not do it with the pilot who was sitting up in the seat and still strapped in with his seatbelt. So he touched the pilot with the tips of his fingers, touched him on the chest and could feel nothing. No heartbeat no rise and fall of breathing, which meant that the pilot was almost certainly dead. Please, Brian said, but did not know what or who to ask. Please. The plane lurched again, hit more turbulence, and Brian felt the nose drop. It did not die, but the nose went slightly down, and the down angle increased the speed. And he knew that at this angle, the slight angle down, he would ultimately fly into the trees. He could see them ahead see them ahead on the horizon where before he could see only sky. He had to fly it somehow, had to fly the plane. He had to help himself. The pilot was gone, beyond anything he could do. He had to try and fly the plane. 
He turned back in the seat, facing the front, and put his hands, still trembling, on the control wheel, his feet gently on the rudder pedals. You, you pulled back on the stick to raise the plane. He knew that from reading. You always pulled back on the wheel. He gave it a tug, and it slid back toward him easily, too easily. The plane, with the increased speed from the tilt down, swooped eagerly up and drove Brian's stomach down. He pushed the wheel back in, went too far this time, and the plane's nose went from being went below the horizon, and the engine speed increased with a shallow dive. Too much. He pulled back again, more gently this time, and the nose floated up again, too far, but not as violently as before. Then down a bit too much, and up again, very easily, and the front of the engine cowling settled. When he had, when he had it aimed at the horizon, and and it seemed to be steady, he held the wheel where it was, let out his breath, which he had been holding all this time, and tried to think of what to do next. It was a clear, blue sky day with fluffy bits of clouds here and there, and he looked out the windows. Window for a moment, hoping to see something, a town, a village, but there was nothing. Just the green of the trees, endless green, and lakes scattered more and more thickly as the plane flew. Where? He was flying but did not know where, had no idea where he was going. He looked at the dashboard of the plane, studied the dials and hop, and hoped to get some help, hoped to find a compass, but it was all so confusing. A jumble of numbers and lights. One lighted display it in the top center of the dashboard said the number 342. Another next to it said 22. Down beneath that were dials with lines that seemed to indicate that the wing, what the wings were doing, tipping or moving, and one dial with a needle pointing to the number 70, which he thought only, which he thought, only thought, might be the ultimator. The device that told him his height above the ground, or above sea level. Somewhere he had read something about altimeters, but he couldn't remember what or where, or anything about them. Slightly to the left and below the altimeter, he saw a small rectangular panel with a lighted dial and two knobs. His eyes had passed over it two or three times before he saw what was written in tiny letters on top of the panel. Transmitter, 221. It was stamped in the metal and it hit him, finally, that this was the radio. The radio, of course. He had to use the radio. When the pilot had had been hit that way, he couldn't bring him, himself to say the pilot was dead, couldn't think it. He had been trying to use the radio. Brian looked at, to the pilot. The headset was still on his head, turned sideways a bit from his jamming back into the seat, and the microphone switch was clipped into his belt. Brian had to get the headset from the pilot had to reach over and get the headset from the pilots or he would not be able to use the radio to call for help. He, he had to reach over. His hands began trembling again. He did not want to touch the pilot. Did not want to reach for him, but he had to. Had to get the radio. He lifted his hands from the wheel just slightly and held them waiting to see what would happen. The plane flew on normally and smoothly. All right, he thought, now. Now to do this thing. He turned and reached for the headset, slid it from the pilot's head, one eye on the plane watching for it to dive. The headset came easily, but the microphone switch at the pilot's belt was jammed in, the, jammed in and he had to pull it to get it loose. When he pulled, his elbow bumped the wheel and pushed it, pushed it in. The plane started down in a shallow dive. Brian grabbed the wheel and pulled it back. Too hard again, and the plane went through another series of stomach-wrenching swoops up and down before he could get it under control. When things had settled down again, he pulled at the mic cord once more and it jer and at last jerked the cord free. It took him another second or two to place the headset on his own head and position the small microphone tube in front of his mouth. He had seen the, the pilot use it, he had seen him depress the switch at his belt. So Brian pushed the switch in and blew into the mic. He heard the sound of his breath in the headset. Hello, 
Is anybody listening? Oh no, did they do? Find yourself. Okay. Hello. Is anybody listening? Hello. He repeated it two or three times and then waited, but heard nothing except his own breathing. Panic came then. He had been afraid, had been stopped with the terror of what was happening. But now panic came and he began to scream into the microphone, scream over and over, Help! Somebody help me! I'm in this plane and don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And he started crying with the screams, crying and slamming his hands against the wheel of the plane, causing it to jerk down then back up. But again, he heard nothing but the sound of his own sobs in the microphone, his own screams mocking him, coming back into his ears. The microphone. Awareness cut into him. He had used a CB radio in his uncle's pickup once. You had to turn the mic switch off to hear anybody else. He reached to his belt and released the switch. For a second, all I heard was the shh of the empty airwaves. Then, through the noise and static, he heard a voice. Whoever is calling on this radio net, I repeat, release your mic switch. You are covering me. You are covering me. Over. It stopped, and Brian hit his mic switch. I hear you. I hear you. This is me. He released the switch. Roger, I have you now. The voice was very faint and breaking up. Please state your difficulty and location and say over to signal the end of transmission. Over. Please state my difficulty, Brian thought. God, my difficulty. I am in a plane with a pilot who is who has had a heart attack or something. He is he can't fly, and I don't know how to help. Help me, help. He turned his mic off without ending transmission properly. There was a moment of hesitation before the answer. Your signal is breaking up, and I lost most of it. Understand, pilot, you can't fly, correct? Over. Brian could barely hear him now. Heard mostly noise and static. That's right, I can't fly. The plane is flying now, but I don't know how much longer. Over. Lost signal. Your location, please. Flight number. Location. Or. I don't know my flight number or location. I don't know anything. I told you that. Over. He waited now. Waited, but there was nothing. Once for a second, he thought he, he heard a break in the noise. Some part of a word, but it could have been static. Two or three minutes. Ten minutes. The plane roared and Brian listened but heard no one. Then he hit the switch again. I don't I do not know the flight number. My name is Brian Robinson and we left Hampton. Hampton, New York, headed for the Canadian oil fields to visit my father, and I do not know how to fly an airplane and the pilot. He let go of the mic. His voice was starting to rattle and he felt as if he might start screaming at any second. He took a deep breath. If there's anybody listening who can help me fly a plane, Please answer. Again, he released the mic but heard nothing but the hissing of noise in the headset. After half an hour, he listened and repeated the cry for help. He. After a half an hour, he listened and re listening and repeating the cry for help. He tore the headset off in frustration and threw it to the floor. It all seemed so hopeless. Even if he did get somebody, what could they? What could anybody do? Tell him to be careful. All so hopeless. He tried to figure out the dials again. He thought he might know which which was speed. It was a lighted number that read 100, 160, but he didn't know if that was actual miles per hour or kilometers, or if it was just meant how fast the plane was moving through the air and not over the ground. He knew airspeed was different from ground speed, but did not know by how much. Parts of books he'd read about flying came to him how wings worked, how the propeller pulled the plane through the sky. Simple things that wouldn't help him now. Nothing could help him now. An hour passed. He picked up the headset and tried again. It was, he knew, in the end all he had, but there was no answer. He felt like a prisoner, kept in a small cell that was hurtling through the sky at what he thought to be 160 miles an hour. Headed, he didn't know where, just headed somewhere, until... There it was. Until what? Until he ran out of fuel. When the plane ran up out of fuel, it would go down. Period. Alright. Seems like a good place to stop.